Confidence in gaming. I guess go kind of hand in hand when you think about it, because one of the things that if you like playing video games, uh, it usually kind of goes hand in hand with uh, your own confidence. I'm making this video mostly because people have been asking me over the past year I've been streaming and been doing more content, um, how do you get better at video games because they want to get better at video games? For me, I guess the whole thing of the perception of getting better at video games, or when people ask me that question, I kind of think in my back of my head, why is it that they are getting better at video games, per se? For me, it was never about me trying to be the best player at something, nor was it even me trying to get good. It was more just because any game that I found that was interesting, or I thought was fun, I wanted to get better at because it was just a part of the natural growth of me wanting to play and learn a game. Most of this example is usually pointed towards Splatoon, but I'm going to talk about quite a few examples today uh, in this video to just give you a rough idea of how I got better at video games because the simple fact is, is that most of these video games that I got really good at, I enjoyed. It's not very complex past that, but we'll talk about it as we go along. So, my first gaming experience that I can remember outside of mostly everything is back when I was, I believe, five or six years old when my grandparents used to own a NES, the original one with the dual cartridge of Duck Hunt Dog and Super Mario uh, for the, you know, NES. Both of these are old classics that I remember I got introduced to very, very young, and when I started playing them, I remembered that I could only make it really to like maybe the third or fourth world before I started realizing I was struggling to be able to beat it. And with Duck Hunt, I think I could only go like maybe two or three rounds while playing the game before I realized I was falling behind and then not being able to win. But I think that was the beginning of the moment where I was like, I enjoy playing these video games. They're really fun. So. I want to keep trying to be better at them and better at them so I can eventually be able to beat them one day. Uh, eventually, I guess I did beat those games, but it was like several years in the future. But I think that was the seed that got planted in me that really made me determined to want to start beating video games because you always want to see the ending. You always want to see a conclusion of something that you like. And some of those games I never got to beat until I actually got around back when I got a little bit older, a little bit smarter, and a little bit, you know, more intent on wanting to see the endings of games and feeling accomplished that I started building this sort of new air of confidence. We jump forward in time a little bit to the first, uh, or second, I guess, technically, Sonic game that I played, uh, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. Uh, when I owned my own GameCube. That was an experience, beating that game for the first time. I did beat Sonic Adventure, even though it did take me a while to figure out some of the stuff for the ending of that game, but Sonic Adventure 2 felt a little bit more personal due to uh, real life situations of, uh, that was a final gift from a family member that I had in my life that I technically don't have around much anymore, or if at all. But, you know, it was interpersonal because that game, to me at least, was the first time I think I confidently beat a game without having to ask or rely on anybody for help. I just wanted to beat it because it felt, you know, as if I wanted to go through the motions of wanting to get better so I can beat it. Now, however, 100% in Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, no. I tried to do that a few years ago, but then I get distracted with all these new titles and then I never got around to do it. One day, I'm still going to do it. But there's a lot of games that there were that there was just games that I wanted to play, beat, and wanted to get better at. Uh, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, I ended up not being able to get past Chapter 4 until only I became, I think, a 
uh, teenager, which then I, when I beat, I was like, I feel accomplished. I 100%ed Mario Sunshine recently, and I'm like, that's really cool, because I think that's a diff more difficult game to 100% more than uh, any of the newer Mario games, for, for sure. Um, what is the most difficult game that I could say that I've achieved a completion rate of that I've beaten? It really is just dependent on the person, I suppose. Because when you really think about it, a lot of games that are quote-unquote difficult are usually only difficult because you're trying to learn how to be more adapt to the systems and the rules of the game world that you're being thrown into. And then learning how to use what you know, your knowledge of the game, and put that into practice and try to push it as far as you can, far past the limits, to be able to come out on top. A game like Splatoon, I suppose it's a little bit unfair when people ask me how do you get good at Splatoon because the real answer, which is just for like any other shooter, is that you just play a lot of it. You just focus and hone yourself to just play a lot of it and just play as much of it as you can. Doing this allows you to basically be able to become better over time, but it doesn't come with just being good automatically. Some people in this world have an innate skill to become very quickly uh, capable of being adaptable and being, you know, very precise to learn mechanics or learn different things and see what works for them and then just kind of keep building off of that one building block. There's a few people in my community who started learning certain weapons in Splatoon because I recommended it to them, recommended it to them, or at least, you know, did my part to, like, show them different weapons and what they can do and different attributes and what they can do with those weapons. Because I'm always one to think outside of the box because there's plenty of weapons in Splatoon that are already great and we don't need to discuss those. But you know, what if you want to use a weapon that is not conventional or something that a lot of people don't see get used? Is, is there any way to make those possible and make them used for competitive play? Most of the answer is yes, but you know, they make you work harder. For example, the bamboozler is a weapon that I sometimes use because I think is really funny to use and not because it's super optimal. Uh, it's not the best sniper, even though it's a sniper class weapon. But because of the fact that it has its small window of recharge and you can use it multiple times within a short period in pressure opponents, I think it's sometimes fun to play because it still gives you the same ideas of using a sniper which is trying to have precision aim but being able to have a fast reload speed to the point where it can pressure and hit mid or medium range units almost instantly but that's also the thing that comes with becoming better at games the more you want to challenge yourself and want to push yourself to learn new things the better you'll become for me, it took me probably until the end of Splatoon 1 to start accepting that if I want to be able to play a little bit better and also keep up with a lot of people who are really good at the game, I'm going to learn motion controls because I know that motion controls isn't for everybody and some people may even be motion sick. But the reason I use motion controls is because it allows me to do something that you can't do with two sticks, which is have two different versions of the camera. The one that you use with your hands, and then using the right stick to still be able to help make your aim even better, you know? Allowing you to see behind you or to the sides of you without having to fully commit to turning your whole character that direction and then being flanked from a different direction. But also when people ask me how I've gotten better, it's just truly is just a race against time because most of the time that I've been playing Splatoon or any game that I find or enjoy, such as Omega Strikers that I played earlier this year up until recently because I've played 180 hours of that game and then I kind of had to play, I uh, don't know, no, Pikmin 4, uh, Sonic Superstars, Mario, uh, Mario Wonder not Odyssey, uh, and all these other games that I came out and I'm like, oh, brother, I don't have time to go back to this game. But, you know, I dedicated a lot of time to games that I like. Uh, recently, my new favorite game that I like that, honestly, I didn't think I was going to like until I've been putting a lot more time into it and been enjoying more people playing the game and watching content on it was My Hero Rumble, which right now you're probably seeing footage of that on the screen because... Honestly, My Hero Rumble is surprisingly one of the games that I thought I wasn't going to enjoy because I played Rumbleverse, and I wasn't really good at that. 
Mostly because I haven't been able to dedicate any of my time to that game when it came out, so I was already farther behind than a lot of people, which is honestly what happens when you play video games. Uh, if you don't dedicate all of yourself to a video game, then it's pretty hard for you to keep up, especially in a multiplayer game. But My Hero Rumble, at least for me, is a better case of a game that I was willing to learn because instead of having to worry about like the Battle Royale style of hoping that you get good loot when you drop, you actually start off with presets for your characters that have moves and abilities that they can use right off the bat. So you can just learn how to be good with a character even without being fully powered up and you can still be able to win matches, which is crazy to me because there's plenty of times that I have played my Hero Rumble and then really enjoyed it even when I'm at a deficit because, you know, it's overcoming the odds. And speaking of games that I overcome the odds with, uh, of course I'm going to talk about Melty Blood Type Lumina because that is the first 2D fighting game that I ever actually committed myself to actually being better at and enjoy playing the game now just because at the casual level I am slightly above average I would say not super really deep into the game because I don't play it every day like you know like I said if you don't play a game every day you're always going to be a little bit weaker than somebody who keeps practicing and keeps honing their skills right but as a casual level as somebody who doesn't really evolve himself always in the game I can still keep up with a lot of top or even surprisingly really high level tournament players or even people who play a whole lot because I just have a determination or at least a confidence in myself that I know the character I play very well or I know how to you maneuver my character, the systems that are in play, and thinking outside of the box and trying to be creative when fighting other people. Which also trips people off because sometimes playing unconventionally is a way of showing that you're confident in your way that you play your game. Being able to show, you know, that you're able to just play a game without having to worry about what you're doing is a sort of confidence that you only get when you get so much time and experience and allowing yourself to, you know, exercise all these new and wonderful different things that allow you to really excel as a game player. And what people don't understand also is that it also extends to single player games. Because like I said, everybody plays single player games differently, even if they all have the same end goal in mind. I play a lot of JRPGs because you can do a lot of customization with your different playthrough, which makes it personal to yourself, but also because it will challenge you in different ways. Uh, several games that I played this year that were JRPGs, for example, I played Octopath Traveler 2. I had started with the Dancer class, and that's probably one of the harder classes to start off with in this game. But as time went on, I started making cool different builds that made it possible for me to fight certain bosses just with that class and without any support. Uh, there was ways to find ways to be able to clear every enemy in the game without having to actually think about what I had to do. I could just do enough output damage to be able to clear enemies. I played Rune Factory 3 this year and realized that, yeah, you can just kind of get away with playing on a harder difficulty as long as you have magic or certain supportive cast or characters or items to be able to excel yourself past certain thresholds that you may have had trouble with at the beginning but then soon realize you can have different outs to be able to just adjust to be able to break down the game a little bit easier and then make it more digestible even on a harder difficulty. I'll also say that was also Silent Hope, another marvelous game that came out uh, during the month of October I believe. And genuinely to me, uh, Silent Hope was an interesting game because it was basically like how you would play Dota, or no, it's not Dota, it's Diablo, thank you, and how it's a top-down asymmetrical game where you have a certain moveset and you just have cooldowns that you have to worry about and you're trying to get to the end of these dungeons. And at the beginning I thought it was going to be very easy, but then slowly as I played the game there was a bell curve that I needed to start learning and understanding more mechanics where I needed to be like, okay, I have to optimize my character's equipment, I have to use different elemental weaknesses, and I have to keep up with, you know, knowing that my damage might be diminished because I'm not playing very well, or I'm not using characters that might be more suited for certain enemy types. Because the more faster an enemy type is, maybe I don't want to use a slower character with moves that take too long to recharge. 
Or if there's a large group of enemies, I should probably start using a character or learning how to use a character that can use AoE stuff so I don't have to feel as I'm getting like bombarded with enemies that are attacking me from all sides and I'm losing a lot of health. And of course I'm going to talk about Xenoblade because of course I love Xenoblade so much. Xenoblade, I think, as a series, really taught me the most importance about like wanting to get better or learn the game in the way that the philosophy of the people who created the game made me want to improve because I wanted to find a good harmony between being able to play video games at the level that I think that the creator wanted while also experimenting with different builds and different things that I personally think would be funny and cool to do. On Xenoblade Chronicles 3, for just an example, one of the final bosses in the game is a 120 boss, which your level can only go to up to 99 in that game. But I beat that boss with a team that was lower level than 90, with a team that's not very conventional, but it made me proud to be able to do that. I beat most of the super bosses in the game using the regular uh, team comp, which was the beginning I would say it would be the beginning classes for every character, but with enhanced weapons, and I felt really accomplished by doing that because most people would tell you to use whatever is the most powerful and just use that. But I just wanted to decide near the end of the game that I wanted to roleplay the game a little bit and say, because I have unlocked everything and I basically leveled up everything at this point, I just wanted to go ahead and just try to see if I can't, you know, take on all the hardest challenges with the base classes and see what I can make with, happen with those. And surprisingly, it went well. Beating a 120 boss at level like, I think it was 86, 7 or 8, maybe 89, but it was still under level 90 and not even near the cap of the game. I think was literally the capstone for that game and how much I appreciate Xenoblade Chronicles 3 for being the game that it was, because I never felt like I needed to be over leveled to beat certain bosses, I just needed to be better with my gear or just optimize my equipment for characters and learn how the integral systems would be to my benefit if I look at certain things from a different angle. Being able to have a mind that's able to see your video games or the things that you want to get good at in different perspectives is a very powerful and potent tool for you improving and having courage to play video games. The confidence that you can get from get video games and playing video games and understanding that the same way that you apply yourself to video games if you want to get better at them is how you can apply yourself to life is, a, is awesome and amazing, honestly. It's kind of inspiring because, you know, just for an example, a lot of people who played, uh, you know, Pikmin 4 and, you know, doing the Dendori stuff they actually started gaining a new appreciation for, you know, doing stuff in their real life, trying to optimize it and trying to be as organized and quick as possible because efficiency is what they now start realizing that maybe they can do stuff like that in real life and make things more efficient and make themselves happy. I myself am one of those types of people who try to make things efficient and try to do them quickly, but not so what's the word? not try to lose any of the quality of it. That's why recently, even though I wanted to do a bunch of YouTube videos, I decided to take a step back because I don't want to lose any of the quality that I personally think I can put into content because there's a lot of things that I can offer this YouTube space if I take my time and I think about it. But sometimes you can lose sight of that by trying to rush and trying to find shortcuts to become, you know, better. But that's the thing. You just gotta sometimes take your time and try to enjoy the fun journey of it. And if you're not having fun, then maybe taking a step back to be able to then go back later with a different mindset. One thing I will tell you when trying to improve at a video game, even though I did mention that a lot of the time you can get better just by playing a game over and over again, sometimes you also gotta know if you're getting frustrated or you feel like you're not achieving the goals that you're trying to meet for a video game. It's always okay to step back. I am one that always says I'm going to step back from a game or step back from playing something if I'm not feeling like I'm having fun. And honestly, the reason I do that is so I don't lose my passion for a video game that I really like and enjoy, but I get myself frustrated to the point where I then don't want to play it for a long period of time. And also just to allow yourself to recharge a battery and try to play different games so you can experience something new 
So maybe your mindset can get tweaked going back to that previous game that you enjoyed playing, but you stopped because you realized you weren't having as much fun. There's a lot of games in this world that you can play. And I really do mean that. And if you want to get better at them, it's just being able to find a new way to accept that it will take time for you to get to the level that you would want to to get. But if you're willing to put in the time and the practice and also know that, hey, for me personally, I have fun with this game, but I can't allow myself to stop having fun with this game because if you stop having fun with the game, it might not be as enjoyable. But, you know, all of that leads up to a certain type of confidence that you can be proud of with your own gameplay and your own style, and you can do a lot of cool things. As long as you just keep building up that courage of keep going back, even if you're failing, even if you're not succeeding all the time, but having those moments where you can be like, Wow, I really overachieved here, and I'm really proud of that, because I didn't think it was possible, but I'm glad that it was. But yeah, my lovely child of the internet, that's going to be it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that it brought some insight for how to get better in general. Um, again, it's not a foolproof plan, but again, having fun, putting in the time and effort, and knowing when you need to take a break... Those three things are the most important to getting better because if you have fun and you know how you want to improve and you love playing a video game, that makes it easy. But knowing when to take a step back and allow yourself to breathe so you can come back with a new renewed self, that's also important as well so you don't get burned out and you can still become better. But anyways, my lovely child on the internet, I have a snuffy nose. You could probably tell from half of the way I've been speaking this video, but thank you very much. I hope you guys have a lovely one, and I'll catch you lovely chows on the internet next time. So, ciao, ciao, until the next one.